Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is nigh to the head of the Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We will go through this and hopefully get done t today with the 20th chapter of Exodus. Well, we're cruising right along, you know. And like I've always said, I don't feel bad if the rapture comes. We'll just let Moses finish it, huh? I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't take offense to that whatsoever. Well, we've gone through the law. Taking a couple of, about three or four or five weeks to go through all the law, the Ten Commandments. You do understand they're more than just Ten Commandments. They're just more than Ten Laws. 613 to be exact. A lot of laws, a lot of work. See, there's the commandment laws. There's the civil laws that God gives us. And then there are the, the uh, ceremonial laws that we have to go through when we sacrifice and when we went through that and we lived in the Old Testament. But today we're going to take a look at how the law affects people. And why people don't like the law of God, the Ten Commandments, to be in their buildings. You know, there, there are people today that absolutely go berserk when they see a copy of the Ten Commandments. I remember seeing it in Northside High School. I remember seeing it on the walls as I would go by, because as a kid, you know, I was a Christian, and, and I liked seeing that. I said, well, look at there. There's the Ten Commandments. We saw some other things, how to be a good redskin and all that good stuff, you know. But they had up there the Ten Commandments. And then suddenly I remember that it wasn't there anymore. I wondered what happened. Well, you know, I think we've seen what's happened over the years, have we not? And how are we dealing with that today? Used to be bad to skip school. Now they bring guns to school. Used to be bad that a few kids would just be truant, but now they're smoking dope and killing people in schools. How's that working out for you? It scares me to death to think that my grandkids will go to, to school one day in a high school where they might be killed. The law of God is essentially important for the people of this world. God brought a family into Egypt, 70 people, pretty good-sized family. Well, it would make a nice reunion, wouldn't it? 70 people down into Egypt, and they came out as 2 million. Had to be some changes. Got to have law in, in a nation, do you not? Imagine everybody in this nation doing whatever they want to do. Kind of like looks like the headlines today, doesn't it? You know, the Bible says in the end of Judges that, that everyone did what, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's exactly what we're seeing. When there is no law, there is anarchy. So God brought the law to the nation of Israel and the people of Israel. And he said to them, I'm going to give you laws to govern you by. Now, not everybody's excited about law, especially when you break it. <laughs> but the law is there for our best, is it not? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Therefore the law was our tutor. In the King James Version, they used the word schoolmaster. Now, I think we really kind of lost over time the, the understanding of what a schoolmaster was. You see, my mother and my grandmother went to school and had a schoolmaster. That was that they had one teacher for one room for all the grades. And that schoolmaster was the judge, the jury, and executioner all in one. The bottom line was very simple. They basically told you what to do. And by the way, that same schoolmaster that taught my grandmother and my mother also taught me later on in sixth grade. Made the little newspaper down there. Three generations. He was my principal and my sixth grade teacher. Boy, was he tough. But uh, the bottom line was simple. He was the schoolmaster. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ 
that we might be justified by faith. The law never saves. The law was never given to say, if you keep this law perfect, you can be saved, because we couldn't. God did not give us the law as a goal whereby we could keep it. Rather, it was like a mirror to reveal to us what we were about. The tutor was the guardian. The schoolmaster was the guardian who was responsible for the care and the discipline of the children of the home. Many times, wealthy people would bring in a schoolmaster. They'd bring in a tutor who come in and literally live in their home. And Paul writes to Galatians and he says that's exactly what the law was. So how do people react to God's holy law? Well, there's basically two reactions to God's law. Either they avoid it or they accept it. You say, well, there's some other areas. Can't we just ignore it? Well, that's kind of avoiding it, isn't it? The bottom line is you can't ignore it. It's there. It's in your face. You can't get around it. The law is so overpowering that it penetrates every social aspect of our life. The law pointed us to Jesus. We either avoid Jesus or we accept him. You see, that's the only hope other than the law. The law says you're a sinner. The law says you're a lawbreaker. The law says there's no hope. Judgment is coming. But oh, there is Jesus who came to satisfy every portion of the law. He did not break one law. He kept the law perfect that he might become our sacrifice, that he might die for our transgressions of the law. That our believing in him, we can receive God's forgiveness his mercy and his grace let's look at the effects of god's law here in verse starting with verse 18 in chapter 20 now all the people witnessed the thunderings the lightning flashes the sound of thunder or excuse me the trumpets and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they trembled and stood afar off then they said to moses you speak with us and we will hear But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. We see the effects of God's laws here. Look at the people's adversity in verse 18 and 19. In verse 18, we see the reaction of dismay. They they saw the lightning. They heard the thunder. Now, folks, this is not just an average, everyday storm. I like storms. I really do. I like everything about them. I like the thunder. I like the lightning. I like everything about it. And there's only one reason for that. My mother was fearful of storms, and so she would always gather my brother and I in the, in the same room, and we'd all crawl up on the bed or whatever. So I found great comfort, I guess, in that. So to me, a storm means comfort. But see, this is not just your average everyday storm, a few th- lightning flashes, a few thunderclaps. This is God coming down upon the mountain in full regalia. We see their withering fear. The Bible says they trembled. People tremble at the law and at God. There are people that are fearful. When you begin to talk about God's holiness, when you talk about the law of God, oh, don't want to talk about this. Haven't got time to talk about this. And and literally inside, they begin to tremble. Hebrews 10.31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There's something fearful about standing before God. Even John the Apostle, the Apostle that loved Jesus, when he stood there in the book of Revelation in the presence of Jesus in his resurrection glorified form, the Bible says he fell to his feet at at the ground as if he were dead. We cannot stand before God. Malachi says, who can stand at his appearing? Lo and behold, we see their withering fear. Fear can either drive you to God or it can drive you away from God. It's your choice. 
we see their withdrawing fright. The Bible says, and they stood afar off. Man, I don't want to get close to that mountain because God told them, you don't even touch the mountain. He said, when you come here, they had to put a barrier around the mountain so that the people wouldn't get curious and want to take a look, you know. There's that morbid curiosity. You know what we call them today? Rubberneckers. <laughs> really, serious. You know, that's why you get in a lineup on the interstate and you think, man, there must be some huge, monstrous wreck down here. There's got to be 50 people dead. There's got to be bodies everywhere. And there's just some little old lady on the side of the road, you know, with her cell phone. Everybody's rubbernecking. What's going on here? You know? God knew they would be curious, and so he told Moses, put up a barrier. I don't want them to come up here. If they even touch the mountain, they're going to die. And so the people were frightened, and they went afar off. They said, nuts with the barrier. We're making our own. And so they stepped back even further. Psalm 128, 1 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. We ought to fear the Lord. That's what's wrong with our, our culture today. Whatever we once were, we are no longer, folks. They're, they're, just, they're just not fearful of God anymore. But you see, here's the thing. I realize by reading the word, I'm going to stand before God one day, and just as you are. As lost people are, as saved people, we're going to stand before Jesus in the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to answer and give an answer to our life, our race run for him. And then the lost people of the world are going to stand before Jesus and give an answer to, first of all, why they never accepted Christ. And number two, all of the sins and transgressions of their life will be accounted to them that day. The Bible says either we fear the Lord in a good way or we fear the Lord in a bad way. If you fear the Lord in a good way, then you are drawn to follow him, not to withdraw from him. Well, I mean, even the apostle Peter followed him afar off. Folks, listen, we're either drawn to him or we're, we're withdrawn from him. In verse 19, we see their response of dread. And then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Moses, we'll listen to you now. You know, before they said, we want to hear God like you hear God. And after God speaks, they're going, whoa, wait a minute. Now, folks, let me say this to you. It's not that God's voice was so terrifying, even though it is an unbelievable. Read in Revelation, you'll hear what the voice of God sounds like. It, it must be frightening. But you see, it is holy. And we are so unholy in this old body that it is a fearful thing. We see their trust of God's prophet. Obviously, they trusted Moses. They said to Moses, hey, hey, we'll listen to you. We know God talks to you, and, and, and we'll listen to you. Deuteronomy 5.25, it says, Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. They were fearful. They said, we can't listen to it anymore. You know, there are people who refused to even hold a Bible. There are people who, if you give them a Bible, they, they'll put their hands up and they don't, I don't want to touch it. I remember years ago, it was my, always my habit of taking a, a Bible. And when I went to a restaurant, I'd always put my tip in a Bible and leave it for the waitress. And this waitress chased me out into the parking lot when I was going out. You left this, she said. And I thought, well, bless her heart, she thought I'd left it behind. I said, well, I did. I left it, but I left it for you. And she looked at me and said, I don't want it. She said, you take it back. And I said, I will. And I said, I'll give it to another. But I said, I'm sorry and saddened that you don't want it. I don't want that, she said, and walked off. So how do you deal with people like that, folks? Either God's fear is going to draw you to him or it's going to withdraw you from him. We see their trust in God's prophet, but we see their terror of God's presence. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. 
But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You fear God, preacher? Yes, I do. Do I fear him like I fear one of the monsters of this world who are crazy, who would shoot me or harm me or hurt me or do something to my family? No, I don't fear him that way. Do I fear him like my father, who was my earthly father, who I did not want to upset and who I didn't want to embarrass, who I didn't want to shame because of my action? Yes. But see, my father loved me. Had that car accident at that time. You know, it it was such just a slight accident. I could have gotten away with it. I could have taken that car home and buffed out that little bit of a scratch there and there would never have been a problem. He wouldn't have known a thing, but the emblem on the front fell off. Pre-super glue days. So I waited and waited and waited till he finally come home. He said, what happened to the car? He didn't, I didn't even have to say anything to him. I said, well, I hit somebody. And the, first, the next question was simple. Are you okay? Well, I, I'm okay physically, but I've been worried about you when you come home. He said, that can be fixed. You I worry about. <laughs> the whole bottom line is simple. My father loves me. Yeah. I've fallen short of his glory. Yeah, I've sinned and fallen short of what he loves me and cares for me about. But you know, I have a loving father who said, my son Jesus died for that. We see the terror of his presence. Next, look at verse 20 and 21. We see the prophet's assurance. Look at the clarification of Moses in verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not Fear, that's the reassurance of Moses. Listen, as a preacher, I want to assure you, do not fear. If you have Christ in your life, you have forgiveness. If you have Christ in your life, you have mercy, you have grace, you have justification. The Jewish text says, do not fear, for in order to elevate you has God come. God said, I've come to elevate you. I've not come to knock you down. Oh, many of us have this false concept that God is a God in heaven with a big stick waiting for, just waiting for you to do something so he can whop you over the head with it. (laughs) Here they come, pop, right in the head with it. Our God is a God of mercy and grace. He loved you and he loved me so much that he allowed his only begotten son to die for us. Who would do that? Which one of you would give me your child to die for me? Well, preacher, you're a pretty nice guy. I'm not a bad person. Would you let your son die for me? I don't take it personal. Let me ask you a better question. Would you let him die for Charlie Manson? Jesus did. God did. God gave his only begotten son for you. He's not up in heaven waiting for you to do something wrong so he can beat you over the head with a stick. He's there to forgive you. He's there to give you grace. He's there to, as the Jewish text says, to elevate us. Oh, the law of God convicts and the law of God reveals one sin but it's to the eventuality of leading us to repentance, leading us to confession, and eventually to salvation. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Oh, we see the reassurance of Moses. We see the revelation of Moses. Look at verse 20 again. The Jewish text reads it this way, so that the awe of him shall be upon your faces so that you shall not sin. He said, I want you to change your whole complexion. He said, I want the fear of God to be on you that you have a whole new countenance. 
that you live for God. You see, God did not convict them to kill them, but to lead them to repent and to allow God to elevate them, to lift them up above their sin. That's why God exposed their sin. Not that he can say, aha, I finally got you. In Psalm chapter 61, 1 and 2, the psalmist writes here, My cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You see, God said, I want to elevate you. I want to put you upon the rock. When you're there in the old mire and the, and, the, and the thick of life, I want to lift you up. I want to put you on the rock. I want to put you where you are safe and sound above the fray of sin and death. I want to put you above it all. And beloved, that rock's name is Jesus. We see the clarification of Moses. Look at verse 21. We see the courage of Moses. We see the people's fearful apprehension. So the people stood afar off. They walked back and well, I'm not getting close to that mountain. They're still afraid. Why? Because sin drives us away from God. But repentance draws us nearer to him. You see, the law will convict us or it will run us away. If we are convicted by the law, it'll either draw us closer to the cross or it'll drive us further from Christ. Beloved, I'm telling you, I see people all through my ministry, and I've been in the ministry over half my life, and I've seen people all throughout my ministry come down the aisle of a church and receive Christ. Oh, what excitement, what joy they have when they finally surrender to the Lord. But oh, I've seen them hold on to that pew with those hands just tight as they can, not coming down. Oh, but if they just take the first step, if they just take that first step, my prayer is take that first step, and the Lord will free you from that fear, from that sorrow. We see here in Psalm 73, 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Oh, the psalmist said it is good to draw near to God. Oh, it's a fearful thing. Yes, it is a fearful thing. But beloved, we have grace. There were times when I literally feared in the presence of my dad. But you know, I never doubted one bit. We had that conversation about a month before he died. I could have been a better dad. I should have been a better dad. I could have done more. I could have done this. I needed to spend more time with you. I said, Dad, you did the best you could. And here's what I told him, and this is what gave him comfort. I said, there was not a time in my life that I ever doubted you'd love me. Always knew. Always knew. Now, there are some people who've had parents who are just absolutely rotten turkeys. They just are. And I understand that. That's not God's fault. That's the choice of our parents. But let me say this to you. You have a heavenly father that loves you. You have a heavenly father that says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You have a heavenly father that says, I'll give you all good things. We see the prophet's fearless approach. Look at verse 21. But Moses, here it comes, draw near, drew near. The thick darkness where God was. Oh, it's a fearful thing to go into the thick darkness. Oh, it's a fearful thing to go into the presence of God. Not if you know him. Not if you have a relationship with God. Oh, but preacher, I've got sin in my life. Oh, get in line. Oh, preacher, I have sin in my life. Begin to confess. Turn to God and he will forgive. Next, we see in verse 22 through 26, the expansion of God's laws. Now, here's a very interesting thing. God gives us the Ten Commandments, but now he begins to do what the Bible calls, the portion of the scripture is called the Book of the Covenant. In Exodus 24, 7, it says, Then he took the Book of the Covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we'll do and be obedient. What they did was, it's not a... a 
reversing of the Ten Commandments, but rather it is an expansion of the law. So we see here in verse 22 and 23 the law concerning adoration, the law concerning worship. God makes a very interesting thing here. In verse 22, we see here, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with, with me, anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you, sh and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, then you should not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness be not be exposed to it. What we see here is this provision for heavenly illumination in verse 22. Look at their witness of confirmation. The people saw the manifestation of God. They heard, they saw the glory of God on the mountain. He says, you've seen in verse 22. You've seen. Tell the children, you have seen. In John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. These people saw God as he came down upon the mountain. Great thunders, great lightning. They'd never seen that before. They'd never heard that before. What? They'd never heard of thunder and lightning? No, not like this. They saw a manifestation of a holy God coming down on an unholy planet. The people heard the, word, the, the voice of God. They saw his glory. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. I've not seen Jesus. Not yet. But the bottom line is simple. I believe. Blessed, he said, are those who have not seen but yet believe. Folks, those Jewish people back in that day did not have that to say. They saw God in the manifestation of God. But look at the words of confirmation. The people heard the voice of God. Today we have the Word of God, the Bible, as the divine witness of heavenly illumination. God speaks to us through His Holy Word. Oh, beloved, it is banned, it is banished. Oh, they're talking about not being able to preach this Word anymore in the pulpit. They're talking about different states saying, we're going to tell you what to preach and what not to preach. There was a lesbian mayor down in Houston last year who decided that she was going to ask all the or demand all the pastors to turn in their outlines of their messages before they preached them on Sunday. Folks, I'm telling you, it's coming. You pray for this country. You pray for this, this work that we're doing. One day, they may close it down. But we see here, beloved, the Bible says it's simple. The word of God is the manifestation of God's voice in our world today. Look at verse 23. Not only is it a pro prohibition of heavenly, uh, excuse me, a provision of heavenly illumination, but it's a, pro uh, uh, a prohibition of heavenly images. Look at verse 23. You shall not make anything to me to be with me. Now that's different than verses 3 through 6. 3 through 6 is you shall not make any graven image. Can't make a toad and say, okay, I'm going to worship this toad. You can't make a, a, a hippopotamus and say, I'm going I'm to worship this hippopotamus. But this is talking about something different. Look what he says here. In verse 23, it says, You shall not make anything to be with me. It means to put in the temple or the tabernacle. You can't make a, a, an image of an angel or a demon. This is a prohibition of, of images of celestial beings. But wait a minute, preacher, didn't God put the ark on the ark, two images of, of cherubs as they would kneel down? Yes, he did. Well, why would he say he didn't want something to be with him? Because here's what the matter is, simple. God placed those cherubim on that ark because that was the throne of God. This is where God met with Moses. The cherubs were symbolic of the holy angels that literally surround God in heaven. This was a little heaven on earth, so to speak. But he put that ark not in the front 
where everybody could see it and bow down and worship it. God didn't place it in the holy place where people would come in, the priests would come in, where they could bow down and worship it. He put it in the holy of holies where that no man could go in except one and only one time a year. Moses was the only one who exclusively could go into the holy of holies other than the high priest. And never again after Moses died. Because God said, I don't want you in there worshiping those angels. Be careful what you have in your house. Be careful what you put in your house, beloved. We see the people here. He said, don't do this. Not in the house of worship. I'm glad we don't have angels and things like that around here. I'm glad we don't have statues on the walls or on the walls. Not to be in the house of worship. Not to be in the home for worship. Look again at verse 22. He says, you have seen that I have talked to you from heaven. Yes. But look at verse 23. Or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. Don't take them home. Not to be in your home for worship. Not at all. I went to a Chinese family one time. Was making a visit. Their family member had just died. And so we went into their home to make a visit. They were not members of our church. But Arthur, my translator, and I went to go visit this family. And lo and behold, there on the wall was a little shelf... On it was a bamboo, a living bamboo stake there, and then they had a bunch of food on that, little cups and stuff. And I kind of knew what it was, and I asked Arthur on the way out, I said, was that an altar? He said, yes, it was. He said, that's an altar that they give to worship their relatives. They leave that food out, that little bit of tea and that little bit of food, and that bamboo, which represents life, for their departed family members so they might come and take part in that. They worship ancestors. A lot of your Eastern philosophy, Shintoism, Buddhism, all of that, Taoism, uh, uh, all of that, uh, worship basically ancestor worship. But there was, right there on the wall, present day. Folks, there are idols out there now that people worship, but not in your home. Had a lady years ago put, put their husband on the, on the mantle. <laughs> Had those ashes up there. She goes, I can't get away from them. She said, I, it just drives me crazy. She said, I go in. She was scared to death. She goes, I go in there, and I'm just drawn to it. And I talk to him, and I do this. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I know what we need to do. And she said, what's that? We need to have a burial ceremony. She goes, what do you mean? I got the ashes so I can have him in my home. I said, let him go. What do you mean? I said, you made an idol out of him. Let it go. And so we had very, I can tell you very emphatically that a few weeks later, we went to a cemetery, put a little hole in the ground where her mother had been buried, and we buried her husband right there in that little hole. Made it into an altar, folks. Got to be careful. Not in our homes. No, not at all. Verse 24 through 26, we see the laws concerning altars. He goes, okay, now you're going to build some altars. Look at verse 24. We see the altar of the tabernacle. An altar of earth you shall, not, you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name, and I will come to you and I will bless you. Now, this altar of earth is not a bunch of dirt piled on top of a big dirt pile, okay? What it was is they had the altar of sacrifice. Now, the altar of sacrifice was not solid bronze. It wasn't this huge thing that they had to drag around with a, with a backhoe or something, you know. They were sheets of wood that were covered by copper. Some people believe copper, but they, they call it bronze in the Bible. And they were just, it was just a, a pit-like, made a pit-like. And it was placed on the sand, and then they would put the earth inside of it to let the coals be a little higher that it could burn the, the, the sacrifice on the altar, and they could get underneath it and, and pull out the ashes. Okay? Now, here's the thing. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about going to the tabernacle and building an altar there. The law of God was explicit about it. 
an altar of earth. Look at verse 25. Then we got the altar of the temple. Later on, the tabernacle is not going to exist. We're going to have a permanent residence in Jerusalem. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, And when you make me an altar of stone, you should not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you've profaned it. In the, in the Jewish text, if you use your sword on it. Now what the sword represented, or what iron represented, was that of that which was death. You would use your sword or you'd use your iron or whatever to, to not create or to bring life, but you would do it to destroy. And God said, I don't want that on my altar. The altar of the temple was an altar of stone. And you see, what was placed upon the altar was death, yes, but it was for a sacrifice which came to repentance and to forgiveness of sin and ultimately pictured Jesus. We see here the altar of the temple. But finally, in verse 26, we see a matter concerning corruption. We see a matter concerning construction, but now we see a matter concerning corruption. Verse 25, 6, excuse me. Nor shall you go up by the step to my altar, that your nakedness may not, may not be exposed on it. Now, folks, they didn't have tidy whities so when they got above this area, you know, you, you, could, you could look, you know, and see. And so what God said, this is, I want you to ensure propriety in your worship. Now, propriety means fitting and what is right. To do what is right in worship. Folks, listen, there's a lot of stuff out today that's called worship that's not worship. I'm going to tell you, a bunch of women writhing around and foaming at the mouth and jumping back and forth and doing all that, folks, that's not worship. That's paganism. Well, what do you mean, preacher? That, that's called, that's called uh, dancing. That's called, that's called dance worship. No, that's called writhing and wiggling and all that kind of stuff. Now, folks, I'm telling you, God says I want you to have a worship program. Yes, but I want your worship never to be crass. I want your worship never to be casual. I want your worship never to be careless. I don't want your worship ever to be carnal. You are to worship God. Why? Because he is holy. Oh, folks, it scares me to think about what people call worship today. I saw, saw a uh, story the other day reading where old Rick Warren out in California years ago had, a, had to have a stadium for his Easter program, Easter service. They went out and rented a stadium. And the band that was playing, it, he joined in. He got a guitar and joined in. And they played Purple Haze for the Easter morning service. And he got up there and told everybody, man, I've always wanted to play that in a crowd this size. Now, folks, that's not worship. Some old drunken hippie, drugged out, strung out, died of an overdose, singing about purple haze being LSD. Now, folks, that's really worship, isn't it? How does that honor God? How is that worship? We see here, he said, I want to, I want to ensure propriety in worship. I want you to do it right. I want you to worship me because I'm holy. Psalm 29.2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name worship the lord in the beauty of holiness folks god is holy you can't go half naked into this thing he said i want you to have your 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 uniforms on he said to the priest i want you to be dressed like a priest but i don't want you to go around showing everything off not only was it to, to ensure propriety in worship, but it was to, to eliminate paganism in worship. The pagans were extremely crass, extremely carnal. Much of pagan worship was and is sexual in nature. Usually it was a form of perversion. What we see today in all our world that we would note as perversion was at one time in the Canaanite religion, worship. Prostitution, worship. You know, they say, I hate that. I hate that. I want to pop somebody in the head when they say it. 
Well, the oldest profession in the world is prostitution. Baloney. Farming. When's the last time you read your Bible? Adam became a farmer in the garden. First job, duh. You see, prostitution was a form of pagan worship. The temple prostitutes were there. That's why all the guys showed up. <laughs> I mean, it took on a whole new significance, did it? You didn't tell your wife when you got home, well, I've been to church. <laughs> Where you been? You're late. Well, yeah, I've been down to the temple. Uh-oh, you're in trouble. There were other things, too. There were male prostitutes down there, too. LSD and all that stuff that we have today, that was all done back then with all the different drugs they had back then. Homosexuality, porno, all that stuff was done back then. That's why God says, I don't want you to even be involved in it. Romans 1, 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which, were not, which are not fitting. Now that word fitting is the Greek word katheko. And what it means is to, the word means becoming. Now it's made of two root words, the word kata, which means opposition, and the word heko, which means arrive. It means becoming opposed to the things of God. And when we worship like pagans, and when we do things like pagans, we are opposed to the things of God. That's why we must worship God in the beauty of, the holy, of holiness. That's why I don't do all the things that everybody does just to get a crowd. Well, I can tell you, I can fill this place in the next week. Let me advertise to you and get you out and give you a bunch of flyers and put out on things. The pastor's going to swallow goldfish next Sunday. I guarantee you. You'll come, I promise you, and I'm not going to swallow no goldfish, so forget it. I don't do sushi. <laughs> the bottom line is simple, beloved. God has not called us to build a, ch to, to, to fill a church building. But he's called us to build a church people. Why the law? Because we're sinners. Why the fear? Because God is holy. James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says, If you want to get closer to God, then purify your hearts. How do you purify your hearts? Well, it's simple. Confession. If you'll confess your sins, John says in 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come near to God. He is holy. But come near to God, not in fear and trembling, but in fear and awe. He's holy. But he will not turn you away. He will not say to you, don't come near to me, sinner, when you say to him, oh, Beloved Father, I come in the name of Jesus. Oh, beloved, there's hope. There's joy. The law convicts, but Christ cleanses. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road, we're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. 
Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.